It's Sunday, it's not Sunday night, excuse me, it's Wednesday night. It's Wednesday night, and we are teaching through the Old Testament. We've come to a place that's more than interesting, it's very fascinating, and that is the seven candlesticks. We've gotten there in the 25th chapter of Exodus. This is about the candlesticks. It's actually God's instruction in building the tabernacle, and it begins by telling uh, Moses to build. He says, I'm going to give instruction to build the tabernacle. And he tells him, first of all, to build the Ark of the Covenant. Now, everything in the Old Testament, Ark of the Covenant, everything here is a shadow. I always have to remind you that. The word, the word in the Greek is skia. It means a shade. That's what a shadow is. It's a shade. When you cast a shadow out in the sun, you cast a shade. Everything in the New Testament is the very image. It's the very image. The law having a shout of good things to come, and not the very image cannot with these sacrifices take away sin. Not in the Old Testament. The very image is New Testament. That's in Hebrews 10 and 1. And we've gone through this so many times. The Ark of the Covenant is a picture of our hearts. You have to pretend you can't see that tabernacle over here because it's very abstract. It is you. And you have the Ark of the Covenant, which is your heart. Heart. That's why I've just kind of put it in these broken lines. It's your heart. Because the law is written on tables of stone over here, kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, now the law is written in fleshy tables of our hearts. The Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled on the tenth day of the seventh month, and we're elected unto obedience in the sprinkling of blood, and now our hearts are sprinkled in, he sprinkled in Hebrews 10, 22. And the Bible says that this veil over here was a literal veil. The veil over here is, the Bible says it is the flesh, there in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, starting in verse 18, 19, and 20. We enter in by a new and living way through the veil. That is to say, Christ flesh. The flesh is the veil, and we know, according to the 6th chapter of John, the flesh is the bread, and we know, according to the Tenth chapter of First Corinthians, the bread is the body, and we know according to the first chapter of Colossians, the body is the church. So when you partake of the veil, you partake of the of the flesh, which is the bread, which is the body, which is the church, and we enter in by a new living, living way, hodos, and that way is narrow. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and Christ, as the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek takes the blood of the lamb or the, the goat, which is Christ, sprinkles it upon our hearts. All of this is the very image, but you don't actually see it like you saw this. What happened to this over here? Colossians 2.14. The handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross with Christ. All the rituals. There used to be a priesthood over here. And there was a high priest. He's the only one that could go in on the Day of Atonement. High priest, one of the sons of Aaron would go in. Now the high priest over here is Jesus, priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, sprinkling our hearts. And we are priests and kings. We're not high priest. He's the high priest. We're priests, and all the Levite priests worked around the temple of God, and we work around here. But we've been talking also about about the altar of incense. There were two altars associated with the temple. One was here and one was here. This was brazen or brass and this one is gold. Everything inside the temple was gold. This is the table of showbread and this is a picture of the church also. We being many are one bread and one body. We're only the bread because Christ is in us. And then you have the brazen sea. Originally it was a labor. When Israel multiplied tremendously, they had this sea which held 2,000 baths for the priests to bathe at every morning. And they would go off and sacrifice. They would come back and wash their hands and their feet after each sacrifice. What we're talking about though right now and we've been into for some time is these candlesticks. There's the candlesticks over here. And the Bible tells us what those are 
over here in Revelation, the first chapter. We see Jesus standing amidst, <clears throat> what amazes me, you got Jesus standing in the middle of seven candlesticks. Well, I wonder where that started. <laughs> Exodus, the, the 25th chapter, these are the candlesticks, and all of this is figurative language now. So he's standing in the middle of the candlesticks there in verses 11, <coughs> 12, and 13. <coughs> when you see seven candlesticks, that is Jewish. Good grief, you guys that call yourself prophecy teachers. Then he goes on down and says he sees seven stars in the right hand of Christ. <coughs> sees seven stars, and then he tells us what the candlesticks and what the stars are in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that thou sawest in my right hand. Right hand always denotes authority. And the seven golden candlesticks, let me give you the definition of them, John says. Or Jesus says, this is in red letters. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. Angel, angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Messengers. All the preachers were called angels. Don't When you think of an angel, forget that thing out of your head about, oh, I saw a heavenly angel came down and talked to me by my bedside. No, you didn't. An angel is a messenger. It's either a good messenger or a bad messenger. It can be a heavenly being or it can be you and I taking a message to the world. I'm an angel if I'm preaching to you. People say, Jim Brown said he was righteous and holy and he's an angel. Well, I am. All right, now. But so are you if you take a message. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And remember, seven is the number of refinement. And the seven Jewish candlesticks are the seven churches. I, it's the first time I've ever said that. The seven Jewish candlesticks are the seven churches. Is the church Jewish? Well, the seven candlesticks are Jewish. If the seven candlesticks equals... Seven candlesticks, which is Jewish, isn't it? Jewish, uh, Exodus 25th chapter. Well, the seven candlesticks equals seven churches, or the refined church. Okay, the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Back over to Zechariah. Zechariah 4. Zechariah sees seven candlesticks and two olive trees. Boy, this really kind of gets revealing. So the seven candlesticks are, let me erase all this. Let me write it up here. Now we've already concluded seven candlesticks. equals seven churches or refined because seven means to refine refined church remember seven is the word Sheba related word is Shaba which means to take an oath take an oath Sheba is the, is the number seven to take an oath means, and when you find taking an oath in the Old Testament, a great number of the time it's this word Shabbat means two, seven, oneself. So when you are sevened, you go through all this far, Second Peter 1 and 5, besides all this, give all diligence, add to your thing, faith, any name, seven thing that makes your faith increase. Now, Seven candlesticks are the seven churches. What else is the seven candlesticks? Right here in Zechariah 4. We see two olive trees. We see, I don't know what the olive trees look like. Let's just call, make them like this. And we see seven candlesticks between the two olive trees. See, seven candlesticks there. And the scripture says that out of the olive trees, there's a pipe that goes into the candlesticks and feeds what's in the olive trees. Olive oil. 
And olive oil is what they use to light their lamps. Light lamps. That's what they put in the seven candlesticks was crushed olive oil. And it lit the lamps. So they're saying these two olive trees feed the olive oil into the seven candlesticks. Well, that's the church. We know that, don't we? We know it's the church. And the church is Israel or the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. All the same thing, kingdom of God. And we are spiritual Israel, aren't we? A Jew is not that. We live of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. So the church is Israel, is the kingdom of God, and that's the candlesticks. Now he says here, <clears throat> chapter 4, the angel of the Lord comes to Zechariah and says, verse 11, or verse 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet, a plumb line, a measuring line. When you see this plumb line, you think one word, ho rizzo. Ho rizzo. Means to bound. A plumb line is for setting a boundary for something inside that boundary. And you're going to find that Zerubbabel was a descendant, was a, an ancestor of Christ in the first chapter of Matthew. He would have been king of Israel if the Persian Empire had allowed Israel to have kings, but they were under the rule of the Persian Empire, and they were back over here in Israel building the temple of God because they had been given the command by the Persians to go back and build it, particularly Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes. These. So when you see a plumb line, think horizo and prohorizo is the word predestinate in the Greek. Horizo means to bound, and you you set a boundary line with a plummet. And you find a man measuring Jerusalem in the first chapter of Zechariah. And you find a man measuring Jerusalem in the 11th chapter of Revelation. What they're doing in, in, in Re 11th chapter of Revelation, they say, leave out the Gentiles. It's talking about spiritual people who are anti-Christ. They're literal Gentiles. They're Gentiles who don't believe God. Keep the people out of the church. Don't measure them inside the church. A plummet. So he's saying, I'm going to measure the boundary of God and who belongs in it. Whom he did for no, he also did proho predestinate for God's boundary. And of course, horizo is our word horizon meaning the light. So God has predetermined certain people for the light. And by the way, the word Zion, where Jerusalem sits, means sunny, and we are heavenly Jerusalem, the church, aren't we? And we are in the light. We're in the sunshine. All right, then he says, For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven candlesticks. He's talking about the seven candlesticks from the previous verses in verse 2. And he speaks of the two olive trees feeding the candlesticks. Something is feeding the church. He says it's the two olive trees. And we see the two olive trees in Revelation, the 11th chapter. The two olive trees are the two witnesses. Boy, that has really puzzled a lot of people. They think the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, tells you exactly who they are here. The two olive trees are the two witnesses. So, these two olive trees are the two witnesses that feed the oil or the truth into the candlesticks or the church. Right? Really, not as hard as it looks. And then he says, they, the seven candlesticks, are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Second Corinthian, second Corinthians, second Chronicles 16 and 9. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro through the whole earth, showing himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect towards God, towards him. 
So, the, the seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord. Of the Lord. But the eyes of the Lord are the church, aren't they? And the church goes throughout the whole earth to and fro. Through the whole earth, showing themselves strong in behalf of the church. The eyes of the Lord are going throughout the whole earth being strong for the church. And then he tells you who the two olive trees are, which are the same two olive trees being the two witnesses. Remember, it takes two witnesses throughout the word of God. The word witness in the Greek is martus. And we get the word martyr from that. Or mature... When you mature as a believer, then you can stand and be martyred and die for telling truth. We tell the truth, we feed it to the church, and the church, the rabbi said that the candlesticks preached truth. So, candlesticks preach truth. And the candlesticks is the church and the eyes of the Lord. And the only purpose of an eye is to be able to see, isn't it? That's what an eye is for. Well, the second chapter of Zechariah says, anyone who touches Israel or God's church, he says, you've, you've touched the apple of my eye in verse 8 of chapter 2 of Zechariah. And the word apple, baba, means pupil. Baba means pupil. The pupil is the opening in your eye. It's dark. It's just a little dark circle. There's nothing there. It's just a hole in your eye so the light can come in and be refined. And when it goes in, it goes through your lens. When you pass light through a lens, it curves light and breaks off into seven colors. Light is a composition of seven colors, and what you see is a refraction of colors. That's what you see when you see shapes. You do not see a shape. You see a refraction or a refinement of colors in your eye. That's what God sees. His children are the apple of his eye. Where they got the word apple of the eye? In the ancient pagan world, Right in the middle is a pupil. In the ancient world, a king would go out in a little cart. He would carry a basket of apples. And he had favorite subjects. And when he saw one, he would go, throw him the apple. That was the apple of his eye. That was the one he beheld. He'd go on down the way and he'd have some favorite subject and throw him an apple. Those are the ones he would see. Now, the candlesticks, I've given you a piece of paper there. The only history that we have of the candlesticks going back to 70 A.D. is found on the Ark of Titus. Titus was the Roman general. His father was Vespasian. Vespasian at this time in 70 A.D. was the emperor of Rome. This was about just a little bit after the death of Paul, the apostle Paul. He died somewhere around 67 A.D. And all the apostles are getting old. And his son Titus was the Roman general. Titus becomes the Caesar after Vespasian. He goes in to Jerusalem slaughters Jerusalem, levels it in 70 A.D., carries away everything, and this is the only picture that we have of the seven candlesticks. And if you look at it real close, you can see, you see how stubby some of the things look like they're moving out there or they're extending out from the middle candlestick. That shows that they believed especially on the Ark of Titus, that the candlesticks was three-dimensional. 
whenever you see Jews depict the candlesticks, they always show it as two-dimensional, like this. They show that it's just three, three uh, trumpets, that's what they call those, proceeding out from the middle one, but they were like this wide. I don't believe that's what they were. I believe the candlesticks was, let me erase this. I believe the candlesticks was like it's shown on the Ark of Titus, and I've got a lot of reasons to believe this. Because when you look at it on the Ark of Titus, the Roman general that came in and slaughtered Jerusalem, you see that it's three-dimensional. If you look at the candlesticks from the top, it looks like this. It looks like this. Now the rabbi said that David carried the menorah on his shield. This right here is called Shield of David, Shield of David, or Magon, Megan, David. They used to have a wine. I don't think they still sell it. Mogan David wine. It means Shield of David wine. That's what it means. Megan David, and this is Shield of David. The rabbi said he carried this on a shield. This is called Shield of David. Now, or we could call this eyes of the Lord. Now, I've gone, I'm kind of reviewing some of the stuff because I've got some things to say here. If you'll notice, the, the Star of David is actually hexagonal shaped. It's a hexagon. And it's also David's star. Like so. Now we've talked about the human eye. We've talked about the eye being. Here's the optic nerve. If you damage that, you're blind. The rest of your life. And then you have up here. You have the iris of the eye. The iris is the outer. It's the the circle in your eye that, that contracts and protects the pupil. When the Lord said, he that touches Israel touches the apple of my eye, what he is saying, if you touch my church, you're punching me in the eye and you're angering me. And Jesus is coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. When you put somebody in the eye, this iris bends back like a bow, like a bow, like a war bow. And tears start running from the eye. And the lens, the, the iris closes up. It starts contracting. You, the iris of the eye, I spent a lot of years studying this, is a wheel inside of a wheel. There is the inner part of the iris. It's a wheel in a wheel. In wheel. And the inner part of the iris, remember, Israel, you got seven colors in the eye. Seven colors. I always like to show the eye this way. Let me draw it larger up here. I like to show it like this. And the anytime you punch somebody in the middle of the eye, this starts contracting. It gets larger and larger. And the opening or the pupil in the eye begins to get smaller and smaller. And the iris, which is the bow of God, you only have the word rainbow in the Bible twice. You've got it in Revelation 10 and 1. And Revelation, the fourth chapter, I believe it's verse 2. It's the only place you've got rainbow. But the word rainbow is the word I R I. Yes, iris. The iris of the eye is the bow of God. That's why he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire. This is the way I like to represent the eye of the Lord because you've got seven colors in it, don't you? Seven colors. I like to represent it like this. Like so. 
now. In the middle of the eye, directly back, straight back. If you draw a horizontal line straight through the middle of your eye, it will go back to a spot back here called the yellow spot or the fovea centralis, F-O-V-E-A-C-E-N-T-R-A-L-I-S. That's called the yellow spot or amber. It's very important, amber. Now, whenever I'm thinking of the eye, I'm thinking of a hexagon. I was teaching on this back in 1992 when I first got into this, about 91 or 92, teaching in my living room. And I told the class, there's only about four people there, five. I said, I'm going to go out and buy a Gray's Anatomy this week. And I said, we're going to find, and this is the one I bought. It's about to come apart on me. This is back, I bought this in 92. And I said, we're going to find in the eye, I've never investigated the inner workings of the eye, but I said, we're going to find some hexagons in there. I said, I'm absolutely God is that organized in his arrangement. And I went in here into the eye section and I found that when the light goes into the eye, there's a lining of the eye and they call that lining, the outer part of the lining, Jacob's membrane. Now Jacob is Israel. Jacob's membrane. Now this is amazing because the man who discovered this uh, Jacob's membrane, the lining is hundreds of thousands of hexagonal shaped prisms that refine color and cause you to see mature shapes. I knew I would find them because see, not that I was a great seer, I know God is that complete. And this yellow spot back here is the main, I don't know exactly how it works, you can read the Gray's Anatomy and find out something about it, but that is the main cone. The cones the cones refine the colors. They're hexagonal shaped prisms is what they are. Like so. Like so. And it refines colors and causes us to be able to see clear. Now I'll comment on this yellow spot. Whenever you look, whenever you look, and I said this last week, when you look at the wheels of a war chariot, a Babylonian war chariot, there's six spokes, and they form a hexagonal shaped prism. And this was the judgment of God that came into Jerusalem in Ezekiel, the first chapter. I am absolutely sure of this. And the Bible says, in the midst of, the, in the midst of these wheels and wheels, and if you'll notice, that's a wheel, in a wheel. These were constructed by Assyrian pagans. The Babylonians adopted the Syrian wheels. This is a Babylonian chariot. It's a wheel in a wheel, just like the human eye. Just like the human eye. And it has six spokes. It has six spokes. Just like the eye. And it has the middle, it has the yellow spot in the middle. And having the six spokes, it's the same thing. When those war chariots came in, and I've said this before, and a priest of God, and God saw, the, and they saw the judgment of God come into Jerusalem in those Babylonian war chariots, and if one of them stopped, what they saw, what those priests saw, was a wheel in a wheel, and they saw more or less. The David star, whoops, got that wrong. They more or less saw the star of David. If they could see anything abstract in that, they could see this right here. 
they could actually see the judgment of God. And when they went into battle, it was as though God touched the heart of this Babylonian king and he touched the heart of some pagan blacksmith and caused him to build a wheel that's exact duplicate of the human eye. Well, where's this yellow spot? The Bible says in Nahum, the second chapter, when these chariots came in to destroy Israel, that they ran like torches, the color of torches yellow. And when you looked at the wheel from the side, they had these scythes that flashed in the sun. They flashed yellow. And they could see the judgment of God. You see those scythes in these movies like Ben-Hur, and they're just ripping the people apart. These were called iron chariots. And any priest of God could see this. I want to talk to you about the hexagon. Hexagon is an amazing thing. It's astounding. There are two things in nature. There are two things in nature that have hexagon shapes that are very prominent in nature. One is the honeycomb. Honeycomb are exact hexagons. Now this is something amazing. Remember the candlesticks preached. Gosh, how can I say all this? The candlesticks preached. Preached. Truth. What was inside the candlesticks? Oil. Always oil is a type of the Holy Spirit throughout the Bible. Well, the oil being a picture of the Holy Spirit, that's truth, isn't it? Thy word is truth. So were the, were the chariots coming into Jerusalem, were they preaching truth? The Bible says in the 28th chapter of Isaiah, they were preaching the truth. God touches, why were the chariots coming into Jerusalem? Because Israel for 500 years had gone after Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech, Shemash, Molech. Molech, all these fire gods. So God says, I'm going to send the sword, the famine, and pestilence, and finally I'm going to send the beast, and that is the Assyrians, that's the Babylonians, that's the Persian, that's the Greeks, that's the Romans. Assyria and Babylon are, are con considered one kingdom. So he said, I'm going to send these people in to carry into captivity. Were there chariots preaching truth? Well, let me look at, look at the 28th chapter of Isaiah. Go over here. Isaiah is prophesying the demise of northern Israel. Look at Isaiah. I didn't finish this. I'll come back to it. Isaiah 28. God is talking about, Isaiah is prophesying about northern Israel being destroyed by the Assyrian war chariots, which were wheels and wheels, and all the war chariots had six spokes. The peace chariots had eight spokes. That's not something I made up. It's in every one of these. McClinic and Strong. It'll be in, in, uh, the, uh, in the Hastings. The war chariots were six wheels. And that had a reason. Now he says, Woe to the crown of pride. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of northern Israel. Ephraim is northern Israel. Ephraim is the second born son of Joseph. He was given the inheritance of all Israel. And when they split, Ephraim took the ten northern tribes north and he owned Israel. He was the son of Joseph. Actually, Joseph owned Israel. And northern Israel is called Joseph, Ephraim, Samaria, or Israel after they were split. He says, northern Israel's glorious flower, beauty is fading flower which are the head of that fat valleys of them that overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord hath mighty and strong one. God's got a mighty and strong Assyrian king that's going to destroy northern Israel. First of all, he's going to bring in, he's going to bring in uh, Tiglath-Pileser and around 732 B.C. And then he's going to bring in, Sennac he's going to bring in uh, Shalmaneser. And lastly, he's going to bring in Sennacherib. And over a 10-year period, 
Assyria is going to destroy with their chariots northern Israel. Look what it says. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty strong one, which is a tempest of hail and a destroying storm as a flood of mighty waters overflowing. When you look at Isaiah 8 and 7, the Bible speaks of the Assyrian army as being a great flood of waters. This is all very figurative. Shall cast down the, to the earth with the hand and the crowd of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. Does that mean literally drunk people? No. It's talking about northern Israel going after Baal in the grove when Ahab and Jezebel brings Baal in the grove in, all this Christ mass system in, and they're drunk because they mix their religion with all this sun and tree worship. It's a mixed elixir that's made them spiritually drunk. And the glorious beauty, which is the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it. In that day when this mighty one comes in to destroy northern Israel, shall the Lord of hosts be for a, glory, a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. God will be glory to the residue that believes him. For a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of lying. This is talking about spiritual drunkenness because the priests are offering lame sacrifices on the altar of God. They're offering the blind on the altar. You're supposed to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Every tenth one belongs to God. And you don't substitute, even though it's, if it's fluffy, your favorite sheep, you don't substitute it. That one has to die. And they would count to the tenth one, which was the tithe, and then they'd go over and say, well, there's an old, there's an old sheep over there. It's blind about to die. And they put this one in instead. When you, do the first, when you read the first chapter of Malachi, God says you offer the blind and the lame for sacrifice. He said, give it to the government when you try to pay the IRS. See if they'll accept it. Tell the IRS, well, I don't want to give you $10,000. I'll give you $1.98. You go to jail too. That's what he said. Offered to the government that way. And the priest and prophet have erred through strong drink and they are swallowed up of wine. They are put out of the way, out of the hodos. Through strong drink, they err in vision, they stumble in judgment for all tables. In Ezekiel 41, 22, the Brazen altar we call it, was called the table of the Lord because that's where God's priest ate from. They'd put a flesh hook down in there if they were offering bullock, if they was offering lamb. And what the priest brought up, they were on a, they each one had to serve, a, had a time to serve, a week, two weeks. And when they were on duty, they'd pull the flesh hook in and pull out and that's what they got to eat. And every sacrifice was offered with salt. That way it wasn't blah, it wasn't bland. And we're the salt of the earth. All the tables... All the altars are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Look at these next few verses. This is not talking about K. Arthur's precept ministries. Who's going to teach Israel not to do this? What if I said the Assyrian war chariots? Whom shall God teach knowledge in Israel? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be up on precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. I'm going to teach you a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm going to have the Assyrians come in and whip you and cut you down. And these chariot wheels are going to teach you the truth. These eyes of the Lord are going to teach you Israel, this don't sound like a K. Arthur precept class, does it? He's talking about war chariots coming in and just cutting down Israel, grinding them to pieces. Line upon line, here a little, there a little, for with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak unto this people Israel. Stammering, la egg, means a foreign. Now, the reason it's called stammering lips, 
God says, I'm going to talk to Israel with stammering lips, lag. You see, the Assyrian language was a Chaldean language, just like Israel's language was a Chaldean. It was a different dialect. And when they were coming in, whipping them, and then chariot wheels grinding Israel to the ground, they were saying, they were, they were, they were shouting at the Israelites, and it sounded like a stammering of their own language. That's what this is talking about. Are those chariot wheels going to preach line upon line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, and with stammering lips and another tongue, will I talk to Israel? I'm going to preach to them with the Syrian war chariots and their wheels and those sights on the sides of their wheels. And he goes on down in this chapter. I don't have time to read it all. He said, I'm going to talk to this people. And he talks about when the scourge comes upon Israel. Verse 14, Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, you scornful man, you lutes, you hypocrites. Scornful is the word lutes. Israel, you have interpreted the word of God for yourself. That rule this people which is in Jerusalem. I'm talking to the kings and priests in Israel. And I'm sending these Assyrian war chariots in. And they're going to preach to you. And you'll hear because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we in agreement. What do they mean with hell? The valley of Tophet was southeast of Jerusalem. They went down southeast of Jerusalem and all that offered their children in the fire to Moloch. Israel did that on the same day they would go back to Jerusalem and offer sacrifice to God in that 23rd chapter of Ezekiel. They would do that. And then he says, when the overflowing scourge shall come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. He's talking to Israel. I'm going to talk to you with the Syrian war chariots. It's going to be a wheel and a wheel. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, tried, a tried stone, a precious stone, and sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. And he goes on down here. He's talking about the overflowing scourge that comes. He says in verse 18, Your covenant with death shall be disannulled. You made a covenant to offer your children in the fire to Molech and to Shemosh and all of these sun and tree goddesses, which is Christmas. You would think God wants us doing Christmas when this is what Israel did. And God says, I'll destroy you with those chariot wheels. They'll talk to you. Yeah, they'll be made to hear the dreadful voice of God's rod. And God's rod is the Assyrian. And look here. And your agreement with hell, hell is Sheol. Hell is, that word Sheol, it's the same word as Hades in the New Testament. And the agreement with hell is their agreement to go down to Molech where they kept the fires burning eternally. Shall not stand when the overflowing scourge. The overflowing scourge is the Bab is the Assyrian war chariots, wheels and wheels. Shall pass through, and you shall be trodden down of it. Now, I'm wanting to show you. Go back over here to the fourth chapter of Zechariah. No, wait a minute. Let me go to the tenth chapter of Isaiah. Finish up the Assyrian. Isaiah's entire book is about northern Israel being destroyed and God calling his people by another name, Gentile elect. Isaiah's prophesying. Isaiah's the Old Testament Paul and Paul is the New Testament Isaiah. Isaiah's entire message is about the Gentiles coming to the light and Paul says, God has sent me to bring the Gentiles to the light. Paul's message was to Rome. Corinth, Galatia, Philippi, Colossia, Thessalonica. It was to Gentile churches. Look over here in Isaiah, the 10th chapter. This is about the same Assyrian. Is he going to talk to Israel? You bet your life he is. And God says in this 10th chapter, I'm going to use the Assyrian to talk to Israel. And I'm going to make this Assyrian come down. Sennacherib's going to come down in that 
17th and 18th chapter of 2 Kings, and he's going to do the things to Israel that I say for him to do. Everything he does will be preaching to Israel for their apostasy. Those war chariots are going to talk to Israel. It's like you tell your kid, you won't listen to me, and you start to pull your belt off, and you say, you'll listen to this. And God pulled his belt off. And it was the Assyrian war church. He said, you will listen to this. I've talked to you 500 years and you pay no attention to me. I'll get your attention. I'll make this Assyrian do the things I want him to do and he's going to think it is his own will to do it and it's me putting it in his mind to do it. And that's what he says right here. Those war chariots are going to talk to Israel. Look here. When you start understanding the Old Testament like we teach here, you know what this is all about, don't you? It's not even hard to figure it out. Look here. Tenth chapter. Look at verse 5. O oh, Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. God says, I'm going to pick up this Assyrian, Sennacherib, Shalmaneser, tiglath Pileser. I'm going to pick him up and whip Israel with it. Well, David said, deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword in thy hand. Didn't he say that? See, he says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I'll send this Assyrian against the hypocritical nation of Israel who has lied and lived wrong, going after other gods. And against the people of my wrath will I give him charge. I'm going to give the Assyrian charge over my people Israel. And he's an evil, wicked, godless man, and he doesn't know me, and he'll be an instrument in my hand, and those wheels and wheels on those Assyrian war chariots is going to crush Israel. To take the spoil, what does take spoil mean? Pirate jumps the ship and says, I mean, mates, let's take the spoils. And they carry away all the booty. And the Assyrian comes in to wipe northern Israel clean. And he does. To take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. The Assyrian's going to tread down Israel like they were mud in the street. Howbeit, he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it, is it, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. He's saying, the Assyrian king don't know what I've got him doing. God says he's an instrument in my hand. That's what he's saying by this. For he saith, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno, which is an Assyrian uh, province, as Calchemish? Is not Hamath, as Arkbed? Is not Samaria, as Damascus? Isn't it all the same? Am I not ruling as the Assyrian? Of course, Babylon is going to, be over, is going to overthrow Syria after this. As my hand hath found the kingdoms of idols and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria, shall I not as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Whoops, it's not time yet. After he takes northern Israel, he presumes to take southern Judah who is not corrupt yet. And he, and he plants himself outside Jerusalem in the 19th chapter of 2 Kings he sends his Rabshakeh. Rabshakeh is an emissary of, the, of Sennacherib, the king, that, that comes and parks up against the wall of Jerusalem. At this time, Hezekiah is one of the most righteous kings who ever lived. He's king over Jerusalem. And his prophet in Jerusalem is Isaiah. Whew, you're going to attack these two men? You are insane, Sennacherib! you got to be out of your mind. Going to attack the most righteous king that ever lived and one of the most righteous prophets that God ever had and you think you can beat them with 200,000 men? You're wrong. And Hezekiah got real nervous. He said, and the Rabshakeh came up to the wall of Jerusalem and said, where's your king? Oh, Mr. Hezekiah, you better get ready to surrender. It's, Jerusalem is just a sleepy little town, just a few thousand people in it. 
and the greatest army in the world was encamped outside Jerusalem. Whew. Boy, Hezekiah was nervous. Wonderful man of God. And he went to Isaiah and said, Isaiah, what are we going to do? This Rabshakeh says, the great king is out here to conquer us. Isaiah said, let me go talk to the Lord a minute. He went and prayed. A, I remember counting the words one time. It was about 64, 65 word prayer. He comes back to his eyes. I said, you can go home and go to bed. Everything's going to be okay. And they all went to sleep in Jerusalem while the great king was at their gate. And that night, God says, I don't need armies to conquer a Syrian king. He sent his death angel, Michael, down to the camp. And Michael killed 185,000 of the men of Sennacherib that night. And Sennacherib woke up and said, my army's dead. And he took running back to Assyria and his kinfolks killed him and murdered him in Assyria. You mess with the preach of God, you're in trouble. One thing you don't attack is Isaiah and Hezekiah. Of all people, you want to attack somebody, attack Ahab. God will be with you while you kill him. Or Jehoram, his son. Or Ahaziah's other son. These were evil kings. But you don't attack Hezekiah and Isaiah, of all people. He tried it. Didn't work. Now, here's the Assyrian. So the Assyrian, look, verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work, notice what it says, when the Lord has performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. Well, who's he going to use to perform his work? The Assyrian king, Sennacherib. He's going to use Shalmaneser the one before him. He's going to use tiglath and God's going to use them to perform his work on Jerusalem. I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. When I get through using him, I'm going to destroy him. God says, I will pick up my switch. I'll pick up a switch. I'll spank my people with it and I'll say, ha, I caught you spanking my people, did I? He'll crack the switch and throw it away. But that don't make sense to me. God caused the Assyrian king to come down and then he destroyed him. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to. That's the best way to look at it. God wanted to. Then he says, For the king of Assyria hath said, By the strength of my hand uh, I have done it, and by my great wisdom I have conquered Jerusalem. You imbecile, what does it take to conquer a little bitty place like Samaria, northern Israel. What does it take to conquer them when you're the greatest king in the world? And you're bragging about it? You're seven foot tall and you beat up a three-year-old? What does that mean? It means nothing. I have done it by my wisdom and I am prudent. Look at me. Hey, everybody look at me. I'm the king of Syria. And I have removed the bounds of the people of Israel. I picked them up and carried them away into captivity. And have robbed their treasures. And have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest of riches in Jerusalem. Of the people as one gathereth eggs that are left out there in the hen house. I just went out there and picked it up. I did it by the might of my strength. And God says, no, you didn't. I arranged it in your mind. I put those wheels on those war chairs so the people could see it and see the eyes of the Lord crushing them underfoot and have gathered all the earth and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Now, peeped was a term that was used by soothsayers, ventriloquists. They mastered ventriloquism. They would peep and mutter. These tiny sounds in their voice like they were talking to the dead in a, in a goat skin bottle. Their bottles were, they were made of goat stomachs. They would cut out one end, cut the other end, sew one end up, put a stopper in the other end. 
After they dried it out, they would use them as bottles, and they would talk into the bottles, master in ventriloquism. And any time they were, that Israel was going to go to war or any of the pagans, they would go to their familiar spirits. The word familiar spirit is the word ob. It's the word bottle. They would go to their bottles. The man who talked to the dead in a bottle, talking to the dead, the penalty was death because you're not talking to the dead. You're just conning somebody into believing that you're talking to the dead. And they would go and talk to a Chaldean magician and say, tell me, should I build this house? I want you to mutter and peep and talk to an ancestor. Should I go to battle? When the scripture says here, no one had a chance to mutter or peep. They didn't have a chance to talk to their soothsayer and see what they should do about the Assyrian. And notice what God says. The judgment was of me. I put those chariot wheels into the city. Look here. And God says, shall the axe boast itself against him that you are there with? Assyrian king, you're nothing but an axe. I'm the axe holder. I'm the lumberjack. I picked you up and hacked Israel down. I'm the one that ran those Assyrian war chariots, the eyes of the Lord, into Jerusalem. I ran them into, not Jerusalem in this case, but I ran them into northern Israel. It was me. Shall the axe boast himself against him that you are there with? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? I'm the one that was shaking the, the saw, not you, Assyrian king. I used you to cut my people down. And those Assyrian warriors chariots came in with the eyes of the Lord in the midst of them, with those hexagons in the middle of them. Or shall the rod, as if he says, and shall the saw magnify himself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should make itself against them that lifteth it up. Or if the staff should lift up itself as it was in a piece of wood. Can the staff raise itself up to hit a pen in the head as though it wasn't a piece of wood, as though it's in power? You're nothing but a staff. You're nothing but a saw. You're nothing but an axe. I picked you up and cut Israel down with those Assyrian war chariot wheels. That's what he's saying. Did those Assyrian war chariots preach to Israel line upon line, precept on precept, here little, there little? You bet your life they did. Took a lot to get Israel's attention, didn't it? Now, back to Zechariah 4. We've talked about these two candlesticks, the two olive trees, the two olive trees are the two witnesses. The Bible says so in Revelation, the 11th chapter. And what feeds the church, what feeds the candlesticks, is the two anointed ones. And he says who these two are. He says these, these two olive trees are the two anointed ones that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Two were anointed in Israel, priest and king. God hath made us priest and kings there in Revelation 1 and 5. We're the two witnesses we feed the church, we feed one another the truth, the oil, the Holy Spirit, don't we? Very abstract terminology. I'm talking about these hexagons. When you look at the candlesticks from the top, it forms a star David. When you connect the candlesticks, it's hexagonal shaped. Two hexagons are amazing in nature. Two things, two things in, in nature that's hexagonal shape, honeycombs and snow flakes. Snowflakes. Did you know every snowflake, there's no two snowflakes alike? And every one of them let me see if I can find this. Every one of them are hexagonal shape or triangular shape, which is a part of a hexagon. Let me see if I got it here. And they've discovered this a long time ago. Let's see here. That's why I like having my McClinic and Strong here. I can go right to them. All right. I got a. It's very interesting. Now, I'm still working on the snow. The snow is water. 
under certain kinds of pressure I've got and y'all excuse me here can you see those hexagons it's amazing isn't it hexagons are very important all every one of the The honeycombs are hexagonal shaped. Now this is an amazing thing because the word, you can see that there. It's either hexagon, of course a hexagon is two triangles is what it is. They're either hexagonal shaped or they're triangles. Most of them are hexagons. You can see that right there in the middle, you can see a star of David right there. That's a snowflake. Now I'm working on the snowflake. I'm working on the snow. The snow is water. The living water is the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God. God says the ice belongs to me there in Job. The we'll look at that real quick. Look here. When he says frost, he's not talking about what we call frost. He's talking about ice and snow. He said, it's all mine, and it talks for me when I bring judgment. I may, how much time do I have, Mike? 32. All right. In the 37th chapter of Job, verse 3. He directeth, well, let's go before that. At this also my heart trembled, in verse 1, and moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven and his, his lightning under the ends of the earth. The lightnings belong to God. I'm going to talk about lightning I've got a special I got off TV. It's about the earth and lightning. We have to have so much lightning to feed the plants of the earth. It's amazing. You cannot live without lightning. The lightning splits these molecules. It causes this particular nutrients to go to the ground and nourish the foods. You have to have lightning in the world. In fact, when you look at if these uh, men who have orbited the earth when they take pictures of the earth, it's like 40 million times a day lightning strikes. You see, and they show pictures of it, and you see all over the earth at the same time. And it has to be. So when, so when a lightning bolt strikes something or it, or it burns a building down or whatever it does, it's God's will because you have to have so much of that to cause. You have to have so many forest fires to cause the nutrients to go back to the ground. You've got to have so many of them all over the world. And people say, oh, that's a shame, that's a pity, and it killed this many people. God says, that's what I have to have to keep the balance of nature for everybody else on the earth. Now, where was I? He directs the lightnings. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellency and will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously. With his voice, great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. For he talks to snow. He said to the snow, if you'll notice, the word of God, I just, it just hit me while I was saying this. When you have the word of, when you got a hex again, you got the word of God somewhere involved there, don't you? Huh? Do the candlesticks preach the truth? Yes. Did those war chariots speak the truth? The Bible says here that God says to these little hexagons, you understand what I'm saying? Whenever you have the word of God, you've got hexagons involved. When you have snow, you've got the word of God involved. Don't you? So he saith to the hexagons these hexagon shaped snowflakes can we put it that way 
The word of God speaks to the snowflakes. He saith to the snow, Be thou upon the earth. Be. Likewise to the small rain. When you have a nice little spring rain, he says, Be. And to the great rain of his strength, when it floods, he says, Be. He sealeth up the head of every man, that all men may know his word. Then the beasts go into their dens and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh a whirlwind. Tornadoes come out of the south. And God says, they're mine. And cold out of the north. When we get cold, that's God. I don't care. You can explain it however you want to. That, this, that the uh, stratosphere and the winds and the, and the, uh, uh, the various... Movements of the winds out of the north. And you can talk about how the warm front comes in and hits a cold front and it causes this upheaval in the weather. God says, I'm doing that. Don't you know that? And he says, out of the south cometh the whirlwind, the cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given. God says, that's my frost. And he's not talking about a frosty uh, little light. He's talking about Ice. And when people died in an ice storm or snowstorm, he said, I did that by my word. So hexagons have to do with the word of God, don't they? Boy, this is something else. And he goes on down here in verse 19. Teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. We don't even know how to talk when God is present. We have darkness in us that we can't even speak. Read verse 13. Verse 13. All right. He causeth it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. God says, I will correct men with my snow and my wind and my rains and my Assyrian war chariots. Everything that's going on is of God. Now, I've got something else I want to show you here. <clears throat> Honeycombs are hexagonal shaped. Hexagons. Hexagons. The name Deborah. Deborah was a judge of Israel over in the first part of Judges. Her name means the bee. Now bees manufacture honey, don't they? Now, the bee, being Deborah, from Deborah, a derivative of Deborah is the word Dabar. And Dabar means a word spoken. With this hexagon, with these honeycombs, the bee is called the word. The word. It also comes from a spelling of the same word, which means orderly arrangement. Arrangement. That is the word dabar. And when you look over here at Jeremiah, I'll just give you one verse. Jeremiah, the fourth chapter. So with the bee, with the honeycomb, with the hexagonal shaped honeycomb, all you have to do is look up hexagonal shaped honeycomb on the internet. Doesn't take smarts. The bees have chosen the hexagon as a building cell for their combs to achieve the maximum strength to store their food. The honeycomb or the hexagon has less possibility of collapsing than any other figure in geometry, they say. It has less on one, on one level than any other. And they, how in the world do bees make exact hexagons, hundreds and hundreds of them right next to each other? 
and they're arranged in an exact order. They have a top and a floor. They have a top and a floor of it. What's amazing, they use the honey to feed themselves and feed other bees and feed, but they also use the comb to mature baby bees. So within, get a hold of this, within the hexagon, B means the word. Within the hexagon, honeycomb is the word. Do you understand that, what I just said? A baby bee maturing is the word in a comb. God's word is in these Assyrian war chariots. God's word is in the midst of his eye, which we're the pupil of his eye, which we are the candlesticks, and that preaches the word. Everywhere you find the hexagon, let me give you something else here. They say it's one of the strongest structures you can build is a hexagon. I've got honeycomb is a mass of hexagonal wax cells built by honeybees in their nest to contain larvae, to contain the word, the bee. And stores of honey and pollen. The hun there are two possible explanations for the reason that the honeycomb is composed of hexagons rather than any other shape. One given by Jean Brozek and proved much later by Thomas Hale is that hexagon tiles the plane with minimal surface area. Thus, a hexagonal structure uses the least material to create a lattice of cells when in a given volume. Smartest way to construct something. And I wonder how the bees know how to do it. What do you think? <laughs> Maybe God put it in their very nature. I'm sure he did, because that's what they do, don't they? <clears throat> the closed ends of the honeycomb cells are also an example of geometric efficiency. Albeit three-dimensional and little notice, the ends are trihedral sections of rhombic dodecahedra with the dihedral angles of all adjacent surfaces measuring 120 degrees. So you've got 120 degree angles everywhere in it, and that's an angle that's hard to break. It's not hard to break an angle that's, that's less than 90. But when you've got angles like that, and you've got this angle supporting it up here, they say it's the strongest of, of these. And he says individual cells do not show this geometric perfection in a regular comb. There are dev derivations of a few, pre per uh, few percent from the perfect Hexagonal shape. Very seldom, he says, it derivates. Honeycombs are essentially storage compartments comprised of many hexagonal cells. They are used to incubate bee eggs and thereby replenish the colony of eggs to hatch and grow. So they're used as places to incubate baby bees or what if I said the word? And the bees from the word honeycomb you get a word that means to go to and fro through the earth what do the bees do they go to and fro and there's the candlesticks isn't it the eyes of the Lord go to and fro through the whole earth the bees go over here and get pollen over here and over here and over here and bring it back to the hexagon what if I said they bring it back to the eyes of the Lord? Do I believe all of this is some uh, coincidence? No, I don't believe that. In fact, let me read something to you out of... How much time do I have, Mike? Let me read something to you out of Gray's Anatomy. See, I, you know what I believe we're doing? Barely skimming the surface. Just barely skimming it. We're not getting deep into this. I don't know enough about it to get deep into it. But I believe that the human body is a picture of the body, the church. 
I did a DNA series. Now, some doctors would probably laugh at me, but I hit some pretty important parts. I did a DNA series. In the DNA series, you've got you've got more information in one cell of the body that's in an, than than is in an entire twenty six volume set of Britannica. More information in one cell in your body. Do you have any hexagons in your cells? Yeah, you do. You have instruction in the cells. How to reproduce, how to rebuild. The cell will cry out to the brain. This comes out of an anatomy book that Dr. Elrod bought for me. The cell will cry out to the brain. Every, all the dust in your house, most of it is dead cells from your skin. You, you die, your skin dies and there's a little fire explosion inside that that's reproducing cell in your body there's a signal that goes from a cell sends the signal to the brain and says give me more fire and in your cell it's that's kind of a simple way of putting it and that is called a apoptosis I asked a couple of doctors do you know what apoptosis is a couple of them said they didn't know what it was it's in my anatomy book you guys need to read apoptosis the common word for that is programmed programmed cell death your body, the cells in your body are programmed to die daily. <laughs> Ain't that something? And are we programmed to die daily? Paul said, I die daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Is that a Greek word, apoptosis? No, that's a medical term. Apoptosis camp comes out of one of my anatomy books. It means programmed cell death. Now, let me read something to you here. Let me see here. I mean, I've got to read something to you here. It's sometimes you just need a dictionary, Webster Dictionary. Let me see here. Now, here it's talking about protoplasm here you say I don't know what protoplasm is let me read it to you okay let me read to you protoplasm protoplasm is the mushy stuff that we're all made up of <laughs> that's putting it simple all right protoplasm and the re I'm gonna read something but we're gonna talk about some hexagons here okay <clears throat> protoplasm hold on a second We've all remember that in biology, don't we? Protoplasm. <coughs> well, it's, <coughs> it's gooey stuff. That's a good way to put it. And we're all made up of it. It's the very essence of life. And we're going to talk about something about protoplasm, see if we got any hexagons in it. I think we do. P-R-O-T. Hold on. I sure am glad I got all these books here. Protoplasm. <coughs> you remember a teacher teaching it to you in biology class and you didn't bother to remember it? Huh? I never took biology. Okay, well, then you're not going to remember it. <laughs> All right, ST. All right, protoplasm. And the reason I have to read this is because it's got hexagons in it. And it's got instruction in it. All right, protoplasm, proto P. Protoplast, protoplasm. Here it is right here. So P L A S M. Protoplasm. Semifluid. 
viscous, translucent, celluloid, no, colloid, the essential living matter of all animals and plant cells. It's everything that makes you alive and keeps you alive. It consists largely of water, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, inorganic salts, and different, differentiated into neoplasms and cytoplasms. So protoplasm is that stuff in you, that gooey stuff that keeps you alive. Dry all that out and you won't be nothing. That's protoplasm. Now, oops, I got one other thing I gotta go to read you. One other thing. All right. Let me read this to you out of Gray's Anatomy. All right, it's talking about protoplasm, which is the stuff that we're made of. This granular, it's talking about, it is a semifluid, viscid, consistent, and appears either as hyaline substance, homogeneous and clear, or else it, it exhibits a granular appearance. This granular appearance under a high power of a microscope is seen to be due to the fact that protoplasm consists of a network of honeycombed reticulum. Your proto the very makeup of your body is hexagons. That's what protoplasm is. A reticulum is it's like arranging a net in an exact fashion. We're all made up of hexagons. That's something. Do we speak the word of God from these hexagons that we live in? Yeah. This, see, I believe, and since the hexagon is the most, is the most stable of all geometrical shapes and can stand more than anything else. That's what we are. And we preach the word of God. We're the candlesticks. We're the hexagons, aren't we? If that's too much, just tell me it's too much. If you think that's coincidence, tell me it's just coincidence. I don't believe that. And when you get over here to Jeremiah, which I was going to read to you. Do I have any time, Mike? Look here, Jeremiah. Look over here. Jeremiah 4. Jeremiah 4. I like that the honeybees go to and fro through the whole earth to get the honey for the hexagons so they can have the word there. That's nothing but amazing to me. If it's not amazing to you, I don't know, maybe you're dead. Chapter 4, verse 29. For this shall the earth mourn, talk about Israel's demise, and the heavens above be black because I have spoken it. And that word spoken is the word dabar. It means the word of God. It means arranged it. And I have purposed it and will not repent, neither will I turn back from my word. And from Debar 429 of Jeremiah. The word Debar comes from Deborah the bee. Let me give you something here. I'm not the first guy to understand this. Is Jesus the line of Judah? Is the word in his mouth? This is Alexander Hislop's book, Two Babylons. I'm about worn this one out. And you'll see a lion here with the bee in his mouth. This is an old, ancient woodcut. He picked this up somewhere in the early 1800s. It's a lion with a bee. They knew that the bee was the word. Let me read just a little bit of this. As speaking of Nimrod, as the sun god, he was regarded not only as the illuminator of the material world, but as the enlightener of the souls of men, for he was recognized as the revealer of goodness and truth. 
It is evident from the Old Testament, not less than the New, that the proper and personal name of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is the Word, isn't He? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's equal to say the Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, as the revealer of the heart and counsels of God, now to identify the Son God with the great revealer of the Godhead. Now, he's simply showing the antithesis or the total opposite of what the Son God was. While under the name of Mithra, he was exhibited in the sculpture, sculpture as a lion, that lion had a bee represented between his lips like it was the word. But you see, that's a convolution of Christ, isn't it? For Debar, the expression, the bee between the lips of the sun god was intended to point him out as the word. The, for Debar, the expression which signifies in Chaldee, the bee signifies also the word. When you see the bee, you, you see the word. And the position that bee in the mouth leaves no doubt to the idea intended to be conveyed. It was intended to impress the belief that Mithra, who says Plutarch, was worshipped as Mesites, the mediator, in his character as Oranos, the enlightener, was no other than that glorious one of whom the evangelist John says, in the beginning was the word, the bee. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and in Him was life, and the light was the light of man. The Lord Jesus Christ ever was the revealer of the Godhead and must have been known to the patriarchs as such, for the same evangelist says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, hath declared, that is, He hath revealed Him, before the Savior came, the ancient Jew commonly spoke of Messiah or the Son of God under the name of Dabar or the Word. I don't believe this is accident, do you? It's like predestination? You don't believe that? That's just, that's just kindergarten. That's just getting started. God's ordained all of these things to be. I hope I meant to get on back to, do I have any time left? Huh? When you look at this that I've given you, you see the candlesticks represented in McClinic and Strong as a star of David right there beside it. And you can see when you look at the candlesticks that it's three-dimensional, can't you? Can you see that? It's three-dimensional. That was the candlesticks. That's the most, that's the oldest evidence that we have of the candlesticks. Not like this up here, but like this. And the base of the candlesticks, you see the base down there? It was a hexagonal shape. It's a hexagon. Do you think this is some kind of freak coincidence? Go, go, go tell somebody that besides me. And when you have this picture of the Ark of Titus, you can see it's three-dimensional. It's this right here. I, and if you try to get somebody to help you find something about the candlestick, well, it goes back into paganism to about 200 B.C., and that's all they come up with. I don't believe that. I believe the hexagon has to do with the righteousness of God. It has to do with life. It has to do with truth. And when it's in us, the Word is in us, we're the candlesticks. We're the hexagon. Aren't we? I believe that. Now, I've been a mathematician all my life. I don't have the education Mike has, but I think analytically. And when I'm studying, this is the way I think. I look at everything. I go into anatomy books. I go into the Internet and look up various things. They'll tell you in here. I, I took... I did, I did a thing on snowflakes here and I've got a thing on uh, on the best picture of hexagons they'll show you various diagonals they draw in hexagons that makes it stronger than any other figure it's not like this is 
just something that we're taking a wild guess at. Uh, he talks about the bee's honeycomb. The regular hexagon has all sides of the same length. Did I finish reading that in, in uh, Gray's Anatomy? Wait a minute. Let me just finish reading this. He says there's hexagonal shaped reticulum. And reticulum means an arrangement. And he goes on what's, he goes on to talk about the filaments of the cell, talking about whenever there's conception, he says stains very readily with certain dyes. And when when this is out of one of my books that Burton gave to me, when the sperm enters the egg, the tail breaks off, the acrosome, the head dies, and all that's left that enters the egg is the instruction. And that's what forms baptism. And the outside of the egg, as it's fertilized, is covered with a stain or dye, and no other sperm can enter. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. When we're baptized in the name or with the name of Jesus, at conception, that's when you get your name. I became a brown at conception. Jim is my title. That tells you which brown I am. But I became a brown, and I got this faith from Harless Brown. I got this force from Harless Brown at conception when I was baptized. Not in water, but when I was stained and died. And when we're baptized with the blood of Christ, no other baptism will take after that. That's amazing to me that you can get things like this out of an anatomy book. Well, I'm just, am I out of time, Mike? I'm out of time. 90 seconds. Well, I'm going to come back next week. I wanted to get into the first chapter of Ezekiel because you're going to have the war chariots come in, wheels and wheels, the human eye is a wheel and a wheel, the eye is the eye, is the wheel and the wheel. Rainbow is the word iris. It's mentioned one time in the Bible. In the, in, the, uh, in the book of Genesis, when the flood came, God didn't put a rainbow in the cloud. He put a bow. He put wheels and wheels in the cloud. Because a rainbow, looking at, it, looking at a rainbow from the top, it's a circle. Wheels and wheels, seven colors. And what he put, and I, you can go on the internet and you can look at rainbows from a plane, from a mountaintop, and they're wheels and wheels. That's what they are. And what happened, the bow of God bent back. The word is sephath. And it was a war bow that God put in the cloud. He said, I'll not destroy the earth anymore. And it was his covenant. I'm going to get back to next week. I just have to throw this stuff at you. It doesn't have a particular arrangement. I say, let me show you something. That's the only way I know to do it because it's just so much. It's like hurts my brain, you know. And I'm not even getting into the colors this time around. I may get into a few colors, but not like I did the first time around. It's kind of difficult. I believe everything is arranged exactly in the Word of God mathematically, physically. Chemistry is arranged it's just that we learn to kind of scratch the surface, that's all. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, what a magnificent God you are to even reveal some of this to us. Lord, we... I'll preach this truth, Lord, from now on. Open up doors and help me to see these things. I don't even know what to say, Lord, sometimes... Your word is so magnificent. Help us to continue this work. We'll praise you and glorify you for all things. Lead us to your elect in Christ's name. Amen. amen. I hope it don't hurt your heads too much. It hurt mine.
Whew. Oh. So pupil means the iris now, right? Yep. Not pupil. Iris means iris. Pupil is the apple of God's.